Uh, Grand Simpson has, uh, has followed, uh, of course, one of the more unusual paths to becoming a best-selling novelist. I was going to give a little bit of his history, uh, explaining why it's been rather unusual, but he doesn't want me to steal his thunder. So it just suffices to say that it really wasn't until he was around 50 years old and had already had uh, some success in other fields that he turned to, to fiction writing. And um, of course, his, his first uh, major work, The Rosie Project, uh, was, um, uh, was, it was a big, uh, big hit. Uh, that, that book introduced us to the world of Don Tillman, the so socially inept professor of, of genetics whose systematic search for love led him to uh, uh, ultimate matrimony with the exact opposite, the wild and impulsive Rosie. Now, in the new novel, The Rosie Effect, Don and, and Rosie are, are living in New York and unexpectedly expecting a child. Uh, this, of course, sets off a series of events that are uh, sure to leave readers laughing and also wondering whether the marriage will survive. Uh, the book's been out for a little while in Australia and elsewhere, and uh, Grant tells me it's doing it's doing very, very well. A review uh, just the other day at the Washington Post uh, said this, quote, for his encore, Simpson could easily have lapsed into movie sequel mode and dished up flavorless seconds. Instead, he has written another romantic comedy that's just as smart, funny, and heartwarming as the original. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Grant Simpson. Greetings. To solve the immediate nutrition problem, I selected a vegetarian recipe at random from one of the websites. <laughs> a job via Trader Joe's suffices to source all the necessary ingredients for a tofu and squash flan. I was left with an afternoon unscheduled time. I was left with an afternoon of unscheduled time, an ideal opportunity to do some research in line with Jean's advice. It seemed wise to delay the shower and change until after my excursion, especially as the weather forecast indicated a 30% probability of rain. I put my light raincoat on over my jogging costume and added a cycling hat for hair protection. There was a small playground on 10th Avenue, only a few blocks away. It was perfect. I was able to sit on a bench alone and watch children with their guardians. Binoculars would have been helpful, so I could observe gross motor actions and even hear some conversation, especially as much of it was shouted. I was not disturbed. In fact, at the sole occasion that a child approached me, it was immediately summoned back. I made several observations in my notebook. The children explored the short distances that routines were checked in return to their guardians. I recalled seeing a documentary in which this behaviour was made more obvious by fast motion replay. I could not recall what type of animal was involved. My phone had substantial available memory, so I began shooting my own video. Jeans would definitely be interested. My recording was interrupted by some kind of communal activity. The guardians and children gathered together for approximately 20 seconds and then moved to the other end of the playground, where my view of them was obscured by a central island of foliage. I followed and sat where I could observe them again, but they did not resume their play. I decided to wait and use the time to change the video resolution on my phone in case there was an opportunity to film a longer segment. Due to my focus on the camera operating task, I did not notice the approach of two uniformed male police officers. In retrospect, I may not have handled the situation well. <laughs> but it was an unfamiliar social protocol and unexpected circumstances driven by rules I did not know. I was also struggling with the video application, which I downloaded because of its superior compression algorithm without due attention to its user premiums. What do you think you're doing? This was the marge of the older policemen. I guess they were both in their thirties and in good physical shape. Body mass index is approximately 23. <laughs> I think I'm configuring a resolution, but it's possible I'm doing something different. It's unlikely we'll be able to assist for this human here. Well, I guess we should just get out of your way and leave you with the kids. Excellent. <laughs> get up. This was an unexpected change of attitude on the part of the younger colleague. Perhaps I was seeing a demonstration of the good cop, bad cop protocol. I looked to good cop to see if I would receive contrary instructions. Do you also require me to stand up? Good cop assisted me to stand. 
Four screen. My dislike of being touched as visceral, my response was simply automatic. I did not penal throw my assailants, but I did use a simple Aikido move to disengage and distance him from me. He staggered back and bagged top on his gun. Good cop produced handcuffs. Well, thank you. And if you're familiar with Don Tillman from the Rosie Project, you will know that he is back and digging a hole for himself in the traditional way. A little taste, a little sample read from the Rosie effect there. Um, what a great turn up tonight on a rainy night here in DC. And a particular thanks to all the, all the old friends who have come along from the Enterprise Data World Conference um, to see me in my other guys. And Tina and never mind. So thanks guys for coming. Let me tell you, it was not always like this. The, the first time, well, when the Rosie Project was published in, in Australia in January 2013, um, my publicist did the best they could with what they had available to them, being the book and me and virtually no reputation. And the best they could do was a small town in South Australia in the library at 3 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> so I turned in, <coughs> walked in, and just inside the door is the bookseller. And he's setting up, and I introduce myself and look around and say, how many books have you brought? He said, 10. I said, 10 books. <clears throat> 10 books. Um, are you sure that's going to be enough? And he said, you're new to this, aren't you? <laughs> so I stood there and watched as my audience, such as it was, wheeled themselves in and, and made a beeline directly for the tea and cookies, which was clearly the reason you went to the library at 3 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. And after a suitable amount of time to relax, the librarian came over. Now, she didn't use these exact words, but the meaning was entirely clear. Now for the compulsory part of the afternoon. <laughs> so she sat them down, all ten of them, one per book, and said, I'd like to welcome Graham Simpson. Graham's written a book, it's called The Rosie Project. And he's going to speak about it for 20 minutes and no more. <laughs> I'd also like to welcome Harry the bookseller. Now she could have said, Harry, the independent bookseller, a centre of culture in this small town, an important part of our commerce, struggling to stay afloat against competition from the big chains in the internet, who has probably pulled his kid out of school to look after the store while it comes to the library in the hope of selling 10 books to you guys. But she didn't say any of those things. She said, Harry's brought some books for sale if you don't need to buy them from Harry, you can borrow them from the library. <laughs> so yeah, Harry looked at me, and, and I looked at Harry, and I sort of understood. So when, when it came time to actually speak, I said, I guess if you decide you want to read The Rosie Project, you'll borrow it from the library. <laughs> so there was no doubt about it. But look, I want to put a scenario in your mind. I want you to visualize this. At some stage in the next few months, you, I guarantee it, are going to need to buy a gift for somebody. And you know how hard it is. What am I going to buy for somebody, male, female, young or old, sophisticated or not? Something with a personal touch, not too expensive, that's uplifting. I said, at that moment, you will be so pleased that you bought that stack of signed rosy projects at the library. <laughs> And let, me, and let me say, at the end of the day, at the end of the session, we sold all 10 books with three on back order. So, for obvious reasons now, when I give a presentation, I tell that story. <laughs> and because, what? Well, for obvious reasons. I don't need to remind you, do I? You've got the message. Okay. But things changed very, very rapidly for me. Within two months of that small town event, I was literally on the world stage, speaking at the, the British Festival Hall in London, 
at World Book Night live television with the good and the great of literature with the Rose Tremaines and the David Nichols and the Jojo Moises and the former poet Laurie Andrew Motion, all these people doing a little five, a little five minute readings. What had got me there? What had changed? In fact, what has kept it all going and got me here tonight? And if I had to answer, I could do it in two words. The single biggest factor from taking me from there to wherever we are now with the Rosie Project is independent booksellers. Okay, so, because these guys didn't just take the book, the Rosie Project, the first one, completely unknown to everybody, and stick it up there on the shelf between Dan Brown and Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> Actually, I wish they had. <laughs> But stuck it, you know, they didn't just stick it in the corner. What the independent books are, they actually read the book. And then when people came into their store, they recommended it, and they started the process going, for which I have to thank all of you guys who have read the book, of word of mouth, which is frankly the only way that you really get the book start going. And that start came from independent books. So they have an enormous round of applause for the guys at Politics and Prose um, here tonight at Busboys and Poets <laughs> together. <laughs> Bradley and Abby, give them a big round of applause. <laughs> okay, so I've done the commercial bit. The question now is, who's going to be speaking before? Hands up. Oh, okay. So, who's heard me speak about my fiction books before? Hands up. All right, well, that's my wife, Anne, back there, so she doesn't know. <laughs> when you knew the job was dangerous when you took it on. So, 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 really, this is wonderful because it's not really a matter of finding new material, just new audiences. That's why I'm here at Washington, D.C., in search of new audiences. And so, I figure from vast experience that what you actually want to know, probably, is how I became a writer, where I got the idea for the Rosie Project how I went about writing it, what's happened since, particularly perhaps the response from the Asperger's autism community. Anybody here got connections with that community, Asperger's autism? Yeah, a few of you. So I'd like to talk a little about, briefly about the response from that community. Then, what about the rosy effect? What prompts me to write that? And perhaps a bit about how I go about writing in general. Sound fair? That was 20 minutes of questions? Yeah, look, well, that is going to work, 10 minutes of questions, 30 minutes. That is going to work really well, except I've only got 35 minutes to do it. How do you cover basically the story of a book, the story of my life, in 35 minutes? And the answer is that's what novelists and screenwriters have to do all the time. You've got an hour and a half, two hours sitting in front of a screen to see somebody's entire life. Obviously, you can't learn what they have for breakfast every morning, unless one morning at breakfast poisoned them or whatever. So, so how do you do it? What you do is you take important, definitive scenes. You try to show it in scene rather than sum. So rather than saying over 40 years, or over 15 years I was continually bullied, you show one definitive scene of being bullied and you realise that that was typical of what happened in their lives. So, and what scenes do you choose? Well the scenes that we talk about, and I've got a screenwriting background as you'll hear saying, the scenes we talk about are the ones we call turning points. They're the ones that you have all had. At some point in your life, you picked up a telephone and you realised in a few seconds that life will never be quite the same as it once was. Not always in a good way. <coughs> and equally, you've probably had moments where you didn't realise at the time that they were turning points. But now you're sitting here thinking, little did I know, 30 years ago, when he walked into that bar, that finished finish the sentence. So, I mean to uh, finish at 7.30, including room for some questions. Okay, I'm eight years old. I'm sitting at my elementary school, and the teacher comes over and she says, Graham, you know last week I told you that your essay was the best essay I had read all year? From a boy, she said. Laugh, something's just never changed. She said, the best essay I had read all year from a boy. She said, well, I showed it to the head teacher, as I promised I would, and she put it in front of me, and the head teacher had written on the top of my essay in red, I will not read any essay beginning with the word I. And my teacher said to me, well, Graham, that's actually very good advice. I think a good word to start an essay with is jury. 
But if you were dramatizing that element, just compressing a few things into a moment of time, what you would seemingly do was push that essay away in disgust. Metaphorically, symbolically, pushing away perhaps 30 years career as a writer. I could have been James Patterson or Philip Ross standing in front of you tonight with a list that long, but no thanks to one elementary school teacher. I pushed it away. And then you would see me reaching out and pulling towards me a book, and it would be called You Will Go to the Moon, because it was the 1960s, and what a young boy was supposed to be doing instead of thinking about being an author was being an astronaut or, if you weren't up to the physical, a scientist. So, roll the clock forward. You, you fade out of my face, you fade in again on a face that looks vaguely similar, still young, but now 19 years old. But it's a sad face, still. <laughs> Why? Pull back, wide shot, and you see we're outside a building, there's about 60 of us, all male, all a little on the geeky side, and it says, Final year physics exam, quantum mechanics B. And the reason I'm looking sad is I'm about to fail. And the reason I'm about to fail is about halfway through the year, I have realized that my dream of becoming a theoretical physicist is not going to be attainable because I'm not good enough at the math. Let me tell you, I am not standing up here being modest. I was very, very good at math. But if you want to have a boson named after you, or a film called The Theory of Everything Made About You, you need to be very, 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 and throw it as many as you like, good at math. And I wasn't that good. And having discovered I wasn't that good, and I would never be a theoretical physicist, why bother? And now the chickens were coming home to roost. I hadn't done the study. I spent all the time hanging out in the library, listening to music and so forth. And I was about to face 10 questions with heavy math that I couldn't do. I'd already failed a couple of exams. The only way I was going to pass physics in my degree was to ace this final exam. So we all file in the exam room, we sit down, and then we open the exam papers, dramatic music, boom, 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 because there's only one question on the exam paper, zoom in, and that question, question one, what is the meaning of quantum mechanics? Three hours. 59 people in that room could not write an essay to save their lives. <laughs> so I, I wrote the essay, I aced the quantum mechanics B exam, and I scraped through physics and my degree and was able to go home and pretend to my parents that all had gone according to plan. So I wasn't stupid enough to push my luck. <laughs> so I finished, finished uni, finished college, and I did what people in the 1970s did who had useless qualifications in math, science, I went into what was then called data processing. And let me tell you, if you think computer people today are geeks, you were not there in the 1970s. Because back in the 90s, because today, you can just go to college to become a geek. You just go, you enroll in Geek 101, you, you, do, you, do, you, know, you do the computer science course or the information processing course, you pop out the end of the sausage machine just like a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant. It's just a regular job. But back then, they didn't have the programs. They didn't have the courses. They thought, we're going to have to train people up. We're just going to find people with aptitude. What sort of people might be good with computers? I don't know. I guess people aren't very good people. So, so they, got us, they got us together, and I, I specialised in database design. That became my thing. And I was sitting at my desk one day. Well, when I say that we were all geeks, we were to some degree. We all had beards. Some of the women looking at it. And one day, we were going, we've got geeks, and then there were geeks. And then there was, we were geek. How many information technology people here at the moment? Oh, fantastic. I, I need to say the two words, systems programmer, to you, and, and you will understand the code, okay? Let's just say this, this guy wrote in a language that is now deceased. He was the only person who could write in that language, and he was easily the smartest guy in the whole department. But socially, let's just say he was the only non-manager who had an office of his own. And no one could buy it, okay? So I'm sitting at my desk, I didn't know him well because, because William. And, and it just one day, out of nowhere, he comes over. 
Greetings, Graham. I have decided to enrol in a Master of Business Administration degree part-time. No, how's your day, Graham? You don't know me well, excuse me, am I interrupting just the facts? I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, why? He said, I have been stereotyped as a geek. I intend to acquire the knowledge necessary to overcome that stereotype. <laughs> And I said, okay, kinky, kinky way of solving the problem, but nevertheless, that's, that's interesting, good luck with it. Can I ask why you're sharing this with me? And he said, since you suffer from the same problem, <laughs> let me tell you, wake up calls come no clearer than that one. And I duly enrolled in the Master of Business Administration program, along with him, and he said to me, we work together, we should study together, and we should timeshare study with physical fitness. <laughs> so we embarked on a jogging program, six days a week, as recommended, and we would go jogging increasingly long distances, and he would have done all of the pre-reading. Now, any of you guys who've done part-time study, now, you know how onerous the pre-reading is. He would have done all the pre-readings. He would have digested it. He would have referenced and read the papers that were referenced by the pre-reading. He would have compared and contrasted. He would have summarised, analysed, synthesised, and proceeded to dump that into my ear as we ran. Now, let me tell you, this was, this was pretty useful. <laughs> I was not complaining, and I was getting fit. <laughs> what, 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 was, what was not to like? Well, what was not to like was that after a few months of this, he decided that the MBA was not for him, and he dropped out. But we kept running, because I discovered that behind this veneer of, um, of weirdness was a hell of a nice guy who knew so much. I mean, I first heard about the internet from him. I first heard of Wikipedia from him. I first heard about... Oh, Today's topic will be remote access to some workstations using the new security protocol. <laughs> Did I care? Didn't matter. It was on his mind. I was going to hear it. Today's topic will be the evolutionary value of morning sickness. <laughs> what? <laughs> I read this very interesting article. He always read this very interesting article, and, and I was going to learn it. At one stage, he got obsessed with Ayn Rand. Oh, no. and, and I got months of objectivism. Okay. Like, yeah. and he, at the time, he was living in a share house with a bunch of communists, with, with Marxist academics, and he got thrown out <laughs> because they didn't want to have an intellectual conversation about Ayn Rand every night. But one time, quick stop, one time we found ourselves in New York City, overlapping by one day, completely different purposes. And he said to me, we're going to New York, we'll be there the same day, we should have dinner together. I said, I'm going to have dinner in Melbourne. And he said, I'd rather have dinner with you. Okay. And then my client, my contact in New York, um, for those of you from EDW, remember Toshi Kabesa? Okay, it was Toshi. To Toshi says, my husband and I would like to take you out to dinner, Graham, in exchange for picking your brains on a technical topic. And we'll take you to one of the best restaurants at Cold Oak. I said, it's all right, bring him along. We'd love to meet him. There's just one thing. It's, this is the 1980s. There's a requirement that gentlemen wear a jacket. I've never seen this guy in a jacket except on his wedding day, and then it was paired with Morrison. So there was, I called him up. Of course I've got a jacket. Oh, sorry. He turns out he's wearing a hiking jacket. And he proceeds to tell me why his jacket is superior to mine in every way. It's tear resistant, visible in low light, waterproof, more pockets, etc. And of course we went to a down market restaurant and we had a good night out. And needless to say, I don't need to tell you who solved the client's technical problem, do I? Okay? So anyway, enough about him, you're here to talk about me. And and I was still doing the I did the MBA. I completed the Master of Business Administration, and as a result, I was able to throw off, as planned, all traces of geekiness to become the smooth talker you see in front of you tonight. <laughs> able to sign in in colour. <laughs> and I established a business 
which employed Glenn Bell, <laughs> amongst others, and about 60 or 70 other people in, in three cities. And things were travelling on very nicely, and then I need to say this loudly, because this is a book event that people out there need to hear as well. I read the book that changed my life. <laughs> And that book was a book called by Joe Queen in the film book, and it was called The Unkindest Cut. And it describes how Joe set out to make a movie for seven thousand dollars to emulate Robert Rodriguez, who famously made the movie El Mariachi in Mexico for seven thousand dollars, which he raised by selling his own blood. Joe sold nobody's credit card, but but what he did was he wrote a script, borrowed equipment, asked his friends and kept just putting a little more money in to make it a little bit better until he spent $50,000, almost destroyed his marriage and a book of return. So I finished this book, closed it, I said to my wife, Anne, who's sitting there, I said, we've got to do this. And she said, what do you mean we? And this guy almost destroyed his marriage, spent $50,000, I don't think so. I said, no, 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 we're not going to spend any money at all. We are just going to use our home video camera to just make a movie just for the heck it won't cost a thing. And she said, no. But I had a couple of weapons. I said that because she has been writing since she was eight years old, filling exercise books with stories. As an adult, she got two books to the final hurdle at Random House. She had an agent. They were encouraging her to go further. And then she got a big promotion at work and decided it was more important to do something about postnatal depression around the world as a professor of psychiatry than it was to write the next psychological thriller. I said to her, Anne, you may never see your books in print, but imagine running on the big screen with you as the star. She said, are you sure this isn't going to cost any money? <laughs> so I took one of her manuscripts. I had done nothing like this since high school. It just seemed like a lot of fun. You know? They say film, making films is a business discipline, a technical discipline, and a creative discipline. So just you know, other than the creative, it seemed just fine. So I, I got it manuscript, and I got hold of the definitive book on screenwriting. It's by Sid Field, and it's called Screenwriting. So it tells you how to make a generic Hollywood movie. Between pages 74 and 76, the hero will have lost everything and realised that his outer goal that he's been pursuing to date was worthless. At this point, he or she will begin pursuing their inner goal. This is called the second act turning point. Right, we have one of those. We kicked this beast into shape. It took me four months because after I'd done that, I bought six more books on screenwriting and, um, and went through it for ideas, made the script as good as I could be. As it could be, we, we cast our friends, we did all those sorts of things. I could talk all night about this. Suffice to say that we showed it on the night to 300 or so of our closest friends. It was my wife's major birthday. To, um, yes, in the theatre that we hired, you hired a theatre. Didn't that cost money? It didn't matter anymore, we'd spent so much money. <laughs> Already. But, Cut to conversation. The woman speaks to me. He says, Graham, there's a lot not to like about your movie. <laughs> uh, as an indication, I play the male romantic lead, okay? <laughs> That'll do. Uh, I play the male romantic lead. It doesn't deserve that much laughter. I was younger then, and it's <coughs> mere stripping in my 40s. And so I played the male romantic lead. She said, but she said, look, there's a lot not to like about your movie. She said, but remarkably it's watchable. She said most first movies are just unwatchable. People just start cringing, they can't watch it. People were grabbed by this movie. She said, Graham, I know you spent too much money, but the smartest money you spent was on a professional screenwriter. <laughs> so this, this, this woman was in fact a noted Australian film producer. So she had some credit and a very dangerous seed was planted. And I sold my business and enrolled in an undergraduate qualification in screenwriting, as you do, with the full support of my wife. Eventually, <laughs> after, after I agreed that I would continue the day job as a freelancer and continue attending conferences such as the one that has attracted a number of people along tonight, so I would continue doing that in the background so that the course would proceed slightly. Okay, first, first lecture. Teacher says, good stories frequently come out of character. 
interesting characters. So what I want you all to do is to go home and write a short story. Short story, screenplay, short story. And write a short story about an interesting character. You can see where I'm going, you can't you? You can't? Okay. So I went home and I wrote a story that I called The Jacket Incident. Clear now? Okay. So I wrote a story called The Jacket Incident. And look, what I did is what you do when you write. I didn't take the whole story as I related it to you. I just took that one moment, the funny moment if you like, where he's saying, my jacket is superior to yours in all respects, and built a story around someone who would say that as a character. Not exactly my friend, in fact, I made him a physicist. Because already I could see the idea of a movie about a physicist searching for love but also searching for physics truth. And when you watch this dramatic movie, you would learn not only about love, but what is the meaning of quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> that was my plan. It would be called the face of God. <laughs> so I still had a lot to learn at the stage. <laughs> but I, before I went to school, remember, I was now 50 years old. I was 50 years old, first year student, and I had not written any fiction other than adapting Anne's work since I was about 14. So I was a little nervous about taking my short story to class. So I showed it to my, my best friend, and he looked at it and said, not a bad story, Graham. I said, you better go to Asperger's. Asperger's. We didn't have Asperger's when I was growing up. We had the radio club. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, I knew broadly, the broadly what it was, okay, I guess. So I took it to school. This is a story of a man with Asperger's syndrome. Well, when we finish the story, all anybody wants to talk about? So, you see this guy's got Asperger's syndrome. You've got to go on a date. I can't imagine a guy with Asperger's would want to go on a date. Surely he'd rather stay home and play with the Xbox. He would be drinking alcohol. I don't think people with Asperger's would drink alcohol. All right, mate, I accept some might. But let's not complicate this. You've already given him Asperger's syndrome. Don't make him any stranger than that. <laughs> don't make him a weird Asperger. But, great, does he wear socks? What? I went somewhere, people with Asperger's don't like the feel of wearing socks. So I think it'd be interesting he's not wearing socks. Or if he is wearing socks, we need to know how he got over his fear of socks. That's backstory, Graham. And at the end, at the, end the teacher said, Graham, I think it's quite clear if you want to pursue this character, you are going to need to do a lot more research on Asperger's syndrome. I thought, oh no, I'm just never going to mention that word again. And then you can make up your own mind. So time went by. I worked hard on this screenplay, which reached feature length film screenplay. The name changed from The Face of God to The Clara Project. It became a comedy. And there was a, certainly some real ethical issues about it being a comedy, which I can do a question time if you like. But essentially, we're not laughing at disability. A, because Don would not consider he has a disability. In fact, one of the most potent lines out of the Rosie Effect is Don saying, a world of Don Tillmans would be safe, efficient, and pleasant for all us. <laughs> He's in a minority. Yeah. Um, and also, the, the, the laughter largely comes from the unexpected. If I say an American, an Australian, and a Canadian walk into a room, you know it's going to be a joke about the Canadian, okay? <laughs> something, the Australian is going to reinforce that as the normal procedure, and the Canadian is going to do something that might be really stupid, but might be really smart. Why did the other guy see that? It's the unexpected, and Don is the Canadian. Don is that guy walking into that room doing the unexpected, because we know what's conventional behaviour. He's also an observation comedian. The observation comedian says, yeah, what, what's this about? What's about when you're a jacket into a restaurant, man? Yeah, tell me what that's about. He knows what it's about. He's just pretending, Don isn't pretending. He's being an observational comedian in, in real life and pointing out forensically the funny things that we all do and just take for granted as, it be, as, being, as being reasonable stuff to do. So, it went through being the Clara Project, a comedy. At one point, two and a half years in, it, it had been nominated for an award, an Australian Writers Guild Award, but I knew it still wasn't good enough. Certainly my teacher did and told me. I threw in a bit of peek with the teacher, actually. I threw the whole thing into the trash. And the only thing I pulled out was the character of Don Tillman, who I reinvented as a geneticist, and the jacket incident, which would just not go away. But Clara stayed in the bin, and Anne and I sat down with great help from my psychiatrist wife, Anne. We worked out a backstory for Rosie 
who would be a strong character who could take it right up to Don and more, but would still have a need for someone like Don in her life so we could see what value Don would bring to your relationship. So, cut two, I'm sitting with a film producer now, five years down the track, and she says, Graham, I want to make the Rosie Project. <laughs> but we'll never get it funded, because the studios don't want to take any risks. They want to make Pirates of the Caribbean 17, but they get a remake, they, 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 want to, they, have, they, want all, um, they want to run with a very experienced screenwriter with a track record, or most of the time today what they want to do is adapt to best-selling book. Cut two. I'm now sitting at my computer. I'm now enrolled in a course in novel writing. <laughs> and I write the, the Rosie Project. Open brackets, a novel, close brackets, and then I do the single thing in the whole history of the screenplay of the novel was the single most important move. I write the first word of the book, and the first word is? It's not during any day. Oh, I'd like to find that teacher again. <laughs> I may have found a solution to the wife problem. It sounds like Gonga, doesn't it? Um, I, it's now first person. When Don's on the screen, we are seeing him from the outside. But now, we're inside his head. We're actually hearing his justification. Every, every, it's him telling the story. The only time it isn't his voice is when other people are speaking. And Gene makes a comment and Don reports it and so forth. But we're seeing the world through his eyes. And I realised I was on to something. And I knocked that sucker over in four weeks flat. Plus the five years. <laughs> Don't forget the five years, don't try this at home, okay? And I, I gave it to my wife, the person I trust most, who still reads three books or more a week when she's not on vacation, and, and, and who is now, I might add, a published author in her own right. I said, what do you think? She said, oh, what do you want to know? I said, does it read like a real book? That's what all authors want to know first up. She said, ooh, tough question. <laughs> I gave it to my daughter, she said, well, it's better than I thought it would be. <laughs> I emailed it to my jogging buddy. He texted me back from the plane to Las Vegas. This is the greatest book I've ever read. <laughs> so I had no useful feedback at all. What did I do with that? I spent three weeks tidying it up and I sent it off to three or four publishers. Not knowing it would end up on the boy's slush pile. It might get read in the next five years if somebody's got time. No agent, no nothing. And I entered a competition um, for an unpublished man, the Premier's Read Government Literary Award for an unpublished manuscript. Note that word, literary. I wasn't expecting any, anything to happen there. I just wanted to get read, hoping somebody who read it in the industry said, Oh, it's a fun story. Oh, Charlie, who works for commercial fiction, might be interested in that. Then I got the phone call that changed my life. <laughs> you have been shortlisted for the Premier's Literary Award for an unpublished manuscript. I started writing the book in February 2013, 2012. Right, 2012. This was now May 2012. And it was just like I saw this door open. That just a crack, but my foot was going in. <laughs> the shoulder was going in. I had a chance. Somebody thought my book was a re read like a real book, and I felt I could make them there. Is Danette my girl right here tonight? There she is. Danette. Danette from the USA, from California, was in town and I was entertaining her that night and I was taking her out for dinner and I was just more excited than I think I've been in my life. I <laughs> <laughs> wanted to do was sort of pour champagne over myself, I didn't even need a drink. <laughs> but she was, she, was, she was wonderful that night, but you know, it was just, wow. So you shared that, that very, very special moment. And things happened very quickly after that. Um, my, I got, the next month I got a, a contract with Text Publishing, my favourite publisher in Australia, a small publisher, but they publish Nobel Prize winner, Jane Katsai, and they're all very prestigious. They offered me an advance of $1.2 million. To the correct response, Glenn. <laughs> they offered me an advance, but they offered me an advance of three days consulting income, which is not three point, not $1.2 million. So I would like to change financially. But then a couple of months later, my wife and I were walking across the UK at the narrowest point of this world was, I was like, um, and we got a phone call from my, from my publisher saying we received an offer from the Germans for translation rights. 
and that was six figures comfortably in euros. And over the next two weeks, there were about 200 publishers around the world reading the Rosie Project to see what the Germans had seen in it. And over that time, we were supposed to be in this bucolic, pleasant walk. And every morning, I was in some English pub in the one place that could pick up Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi reception, such as it was, yelling down the Skype connection, is that dollars or yen they're offering? <laughs> so it, it sort of took a little bit of a bucolic walk. And, and, and Anna just steamed for the first hour of our walk until she said, all right, how much money is a day? <laughs> And at the end of it, the answer to all those questions was enough for me in August of 20, uh, 2012, um, only in six months or so after I started writing the book, for me to be able to raise a glass of English ale and say goodbye to the day job. So I've been essentially a full-time writer since then. Um, we went full. The book's been published. We have um, now sold rights in 42, 43 languages, um, sold about 2 million around the world. Um, gone full circle, it's number one in Germany right now, so the Germans are best because okay. Um, but we're full circle with the screen rights. Sony Pictures said they want to make it, and they said we'll get one of the best screenwriters in Hollywood to adapt to a novel. <laughs> so, hold on. And my agent said, that's very sweet, Graham. <laughs> but we had a little discussion, a negotiation, I got to so I've done two drafts of the screenplay for Sony Pictures. Uh, we have producers, directors, and rewriters. Good guys, they did Bob Now Stars, Me Before You, uh, 500 Days of Summer, we have experienced people um, doing the rewrite, as, as you would expect. Um, I just had my agent was in touch with me um, just, just yesterday, saying that they are now chasing a particular actor to play the lead role of the Don, and they can't tell you who it is, but you know his name. Um, <laughs> I really can't. But so so that that's all happened. There was never oh just quickly the response from the Asperger's community. I, even though I don't say that Don has Asperger's, I knew there would be plenty of people who identified him as such. Indeed, the Premier's Literary Award was citation said Don Tillman is a professor of genetics with undiagnosed Asperger's syndrome. Uh, undiagnosed it's by the experts on the Premier's Literary Award Committee. Um, so, well, okay, that's what people are going to do. Um, so I sent the manuscript out to a lot of people in the Asperger's or we say autism community and got nothing but positive feedback. They essentially felt that he was typical but not stereotypical and that he was a fine role and would be, would be well received. So, okay, but I knew there would be, we would have our moments. On the launch night, the actual night of the launch in a bookstore like this, you know, setting, I finished speech, round of applause, family and friends, and this guy just marches straight up to me and says, My name is Martin, I've got Asperger's syndrome and I've got a problem with your book. <laughs> I said, Go on. He said, Page 73, line 17. <laughs> he says, Don says he doesn't want a partner who is mathematically illiterate. The word is enumerant. <laughs> Don Tillman would not make that mistake. But fortunately, I had a discussion with my editor, and I was able to say, no, no, the, the terms are used differently. Um, in, a mathematician would say enumerant means you can't add, you can't count, add, subtract, multiply, divide, basic stuff. But mathematically illiterate means can't pass quantum mechanics B. He said, excellent. <laughs> I'll take three copies. <laughs> uh, I said, and he said, I want to give it to my friends. Show them what like to have Asperger's syndrome. Oh. And a lot of people with Asperger's have said exactly that. I don't identify as having Asperger's syndrome, but I think the fact that you know, I don't have Asperger's syndrome, I think one of the interesting things is that it's not that hard to get inside the head of someone, even if you're credible enough in that community. You know, talk about people with Asperger's not being empathetic enough, it's I think neurotypicals could be a bit unempathetic towards people with Asperger's and not make that attempt to get inside the head. The people who thought, hey, Paul and Clark, she said, my dad had Asperger's syndrome. We all thought my dad had Asperger's syndrome, and we kept trying to persuade him that he did, because it would be easier for everyone if he gets acknowledged it. We get these books on Asperger's syndrome, he's an engineer. He said, that is not me. He said, finally we gave him the Rosie project, and he said, I'm coming out. <laughs> 
so it is had a great it was not meant to be a second um, I, you know, no sequels to romantic comedies, but I basically came back to Don, even after writing another book, drafting it. I came back for two reasons. One, because people were saying to me, you can't have a happily ever after ending. Someone like Don could make a successful marriage. I garbage. And I, just, and I wanted to answer that question. And the other was, I've been gifted a character who created comedy wherever he went. It's very few authors even get one of those in their lifetime. If I was going to do that sort of writing, Don was my avatar. You like. And I want to explore some more things. I want to explore marriage. I, mean, I want to explore serious topics, even though they're comedy. I know some people will read them and lightly throw them away. Um, and the others, you know, Bill Gates is profound, you know? I was funny, Melinda Gates reads it and says, You'll love this, Bill, it's hilarious. Bill reads it, it's profound. So, <laughs> but that's a very typical male female reaction, actually. So I wanted to use it again, and I decided to write about, uh, about making marriage work. It's not really a book about pregnancy, it's a book about marriage. And the pregnancy is just one stress that's brought onto that marriage. And the question is, if, you know, as well as Don's buddy Gene coming to live with him and a few other minor things like that, how can the marriage go? And I might say a few people in the book have said, Rosie, we don't like her so much. She's not as nice as she was in the first book. Deliberately. Nancy Reagan, that famous philosopher, <coughs> Um, marriages are never 50-50, they're always 90-10. And I want to show Don at a time when the marriage was 90, where he had been putting in 90% because Rosie was doing it tough. Anybody who's ever been in a marriage knows that sometimes one of you, sometimes you, are doing it tough and you're not exactly exemplar of good behaviour. I wanted Rosie to be that person and Don to have to actually step up to the plate. So let me just tell you to finish how I write, because people are often interested in how I go about writing. Writers divide themselves into pantsers and planners. A pantser writes by the seat of their pants. They make it up as they go along. They write one true sentence as anyone would say, then another, then another, and so on. When it's done, it's done. Planners do a plan before they start. I was always going to be a planner. I and mean, imagine being a pantser as a computer program. And I just make it up as I go along. <laughs> You're not going to last long. You are not. And I also came to... <laughs> and I also came to screenwriting. And screenwriters are planners. In fact, screenwriting is done collaboratively. It was great and bad. It didn't come out of one person sitting in an attic. It came out of a bunch of people sitting in a writer's room, kicking around ideas until they got the cards. And the cards are a scene, one card per scene, showing what the scenes will be, what will happen in each scene. Then they say, OK, it's your turn tonight. Take it home and write it up, and then we'll review it and so on. But the planning, the plot, what I do on cards. So the novel is about 100 cards. It's about 100 scenes laid out on the floor. Where do I get the scenes from? Well, some of them are top down. You say, well, obviously it's got to be an inciting incident. Something's got to happen to get the story moving. And that'll be Rosie announces she's pregnant, for example. Rosie announces pregnancy. Then I've got to think about how I do it. And as a great collaborator, this we kick it around. This one I got to myself because I remembered how Anne announced her pregnancy 25 years ago. She, we were serious drinkers. Still are. And, <laughs> And I looked at, on the table, instead of wine, she put two glasses of orange juice. Ah, uh, isn't that sweet? So I figured that that's what Rosie would do, except Don wouldn't get the hint. And then we're feeling they need to add a vodka or, or whatever. So what was going to happen to you is lay that down, and then say, well, obviously what have next, next, next. And you start to flesh out a bit of a shape. Sometimes the card comes out of that field. I can remember, you know, the scene didn't have to be there. But... Are there any lactation consultants here tonight? <laughs> Just checking, because I had a few. Um, I went to antenatal, prenatal classes. You go to those to learn for a man what's going to be like, what's going to be particularly. Yeah. And, and we had the lactation consultant saying, you were breastfed, etc. And at the end she said, and you men, you have to support your wives in their decision to breastfeed. And I said, or not, because it's a decision, isn't it? It didn't go down well. <laughs> But good, Don will do that. So I go out jogging with my jogging buddies, who is the go-to person for what would Don do. And I go out jogging, and I tell him the story, he says, yes, yes, he says, the argument always given is it maximizes the immune system for the baby. But it doesn't. Breastfeeding just but as we currently do it, does not maximize the immune system. In the ancestral environment, the immune system was maximized even further because the women shared their babies. <laughs> this is going to go down well in New York City. <laughs> so, we became the, the anti-nail uproar. So, 
So when it comes to writing, all you do is you lay out the cards, you sit down and you start writing. You don't get writing block because it is you new. Know, because if you get stuck, you just blow your standards, keep going. So, and then you come back and you clean it up later. So, okay, you're going to go out of this tonight, and people say, well, this guy, Graham, how's he write? And you say, like a database designer? <laughs> well, you probably be replaced by a machine at some stage. I mean, it's just all mechanics, it's top down designer. So, I want to give you a story to finish with, so that when you leave, this is the story you've got to tell people, okay? So, I had written a bit of it. But then Anne and I had three weeks vacation in New York City. And I wasn't going to write. I thought, hang on, that's stupid. I'm going to be in New York where the book is set. I should be writing. In fact, what would it take to finish it? I have 40,000 words to go. 20 days, 2,000 words a day. Any writers here? That's a lot. Okay. How was I going to motivate myself? I said, Anne, this is what I'm going to do. Any day I don't write 2,000 words, no drink. <laughs> She said, you can't motivate yourself with alcohol. I said, just watch me. <laughs> I did not miss a single day. Christmas morning, I've woken up and said, don't you have a hangover? I said, yeah, yeah, but I got 2,000 words to write before lunch. So, <laughs> so I got it done. So if anybody else had a dream to right, I want you to tell them. The Rosie Project was written in a hotel in a 20-day drunken binge in New York City. <laughs> So I'm, I'm very, yeah, Abby is just sneaking up here, but she's, you don't mind if I have some questions here, Abby? No. Good, let's take some questions. Oh, you've got the I'm microphone. Graham, you meant the rosy effect that you wrote drunk, not... Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was waving that book around. Yeah, yeah. So if you have questions, I'd love to walk around the microphone to you so that we can all hear your question. Does anyone want to be first? Sorry, if you want to talk What did one spouse do on a three-week vacation when they were writing when they offered a grand twenty-five thousand words a day? Well, we still managed to go out and drink. I'm, I'm not quite sure what Anne did for the rest of the day. <laughs> she was, uh, to be fair, Anne, Anne, Anne just got published before me. Anne actually decided she would write erotic fiction for a while, and she wrote eleven novels and novellas under the pseudonym Simone Sinner, S-I-N-N-A, which is an anagram of Anne with an E Simpson. Um, and then just recently started to get back into mainstream fiction writing and has her first mainstream novel called Medea's Curse. Medea's Curse, published by Text Publishing. You can actually order it online um, just a couple of months ago. Well, I was What was the inspiration for Don going the baby's development on the walls at his bathroom office? Well, you know what? Don plotting the baby's development on the wall of the bathroom office after the first draft this happened because they said they wanted more markers for the pregnancy. They wanted to know time markers, where were we up to, the women readers would want to know how many months she was along and all those sorts of things. This is the sort of chick lit push saying you're not to about the pregnancy as a thing from about the marriage. So, but let's put some time markers in. I thought, how would I do time markers? And then I was staying in a hotel and the, in the bathroom, tiles, just, well, they'd be just the right size. In fact, those tiles that are in the book are the same size as the numbers as the bathroom tiles when they come to Spain. So let's put time markers. By the way, time is a killer for this book. I had to do this very detailed because there are people who read these books and say, oh no, no, you could have put the woman in winter, so it wouldn't have been such and such, or that was a Friday, so they were not. Um, and you had a pregnancy, you had Rosie studying at Columbia, so there were semester breaks and all those sorts of things. So yeah, I got to work in the end. So um, I'll start by saying I do have Asperger's, very mild form. My wife and I have also often wondered what I'd be like with children, having our own children. Do you have any thoughts or plans on what Don will be like as a father? Um, yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts of what Don will be like as a father, but I'm actually saving the book through. I decided, I decided that there would be a third, a third book, but not immediately. I mean, we know that, that Rosie gets pregnant. You can guess what the outcome of that is. 
let's add seven years to it and come back and have a look and see how it's and see how it's trailing. I think it's an interesting time to come and to come and look. And let's just uh, people. A number of people asked if I wrote a, piece, a prequel because they would love to know what it was like for Don growing up as a kid. And I think it would be interesting, but the trouble is that would be back in the 1980s when attitudes and services are very different from what they are now. And therefore, I wouldn't be making a useful statement about today. I thought, let's let Don's child be a representative of Don, if you like, perhaps going through the same sort of stuff, but right here in the, uh, in the, in the 2000s. Um, so it's been really fun being on this journey and being able to be there at that first moment when you found out. Thanks, Graham. So, uh, timeline for the movie when you might be able to see it, and what other things uh, do you have in mind for you know what's next? Yeah, look, timeline for the movie. What it comes down to, technically, they've got 18 months, but they can review that option and go go for longer. It, I'm told that it's about the actor at the moment. They have a particular actor in mind, and they've got to find when he's available and whether they can fit him in or whether he wants to do it. If he says no, they'll be looking for somebody else, and that's, that's now, it seems to be making and determining the time. Um, do I have any plans for anything else in between? Is that the other one? Yep. Uh, yeah. In between, um, I'm hoping to write two other books. I'm working on one at the moment, which is due with the publisher in a couple of months. It's about a love affair rekindled after 22 years. So people meet, fall in love, go their different paths, but always feel he slash she was the one. What happens when they reconnect by the internet? years later, complicated things happen. And the other is a, a romance, oh, sorry, not romance, a romantic comedy set on the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, the famous pilgrim's walk from France and Spain, with me and Anne writing alternate chapters. So male and female voice, which leads itself immediately to comedy, because you know, that went well, start a new chapter, and get the other opinion. So, and both of those are in very sort of rough draft form already. Is there any reason why Gene didn't pursue anything in an Irish context? Is it you know? Is there any reason that Gene didn't pursue an Irish context? Like, it, who's Irish here? Put your hand up. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, well, look, since you're the only person I'm going to offend, and I, I can buy you a book later, um, somebody said the only unrealistic thing about the Rosie Project was that Gene didn't have a pin in Ireland. <laughs> So, we have time for just two more, so. Thank you. Um, one of the things that really strikes me about Don's character in the book is how careful he has to be to protect himself from the world. And what I think is really interesting is that we actually all do that. We just decide to protect ourselves from different things. So one of the things that really worked for me in his character is that he was so consistent, but so willing at times to break out of that. He was prepared to take a risk. Uh, yes. I've, got, I've got a good friend who's a psychoanalyst um, who really liked the Rosie project, but he said he just loved the Rosie effect. He said he cried reading it because exactly what you're talking about, about the constant pressure that Don has to take to protect himself, to work out what's going on around him without picking it up intuitively as a, as a neurotypical would. But yeah, the very positive thing, I'm, I'm not an expert in Asperger's syndrome, but I now find that because more people will read The Rosie Project, in fact more people will watch Big Bang Theory than will ever read any technical books on Asperger's syndrome, that is where they get their, their information from. So you actually become quite responsible in terms of, of putting images out there. And I, I've now spoken at, at a number of conferences on it. And one of the things I say from my experience with people who almost certainly had Asperger's but were not whatever diagnosed because of the times, is it gets easier when they leave school. Not because they grow out of Asperger's necessarily, but one, they, they develop more social skills, but two, they have a choice about where they work, about who they hang out with, and they're not pushed into activities which are not, are not suitable for them. They can find their own world. And I think Don is fundamentally a reasonably happy person. He's found his own place in the world, but in that first book, he's just got this one missing thing. He doesn't have a partner. And let me say, he's not the only person in the world who's found themselves in that position. <laughs> The last question's over here. One more, I think. Yeah, yeah. What do you really think about vegans? What do I think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see Steve Hogan out there. <laughs> uh, what, do I really, what do I really think about vegans? Um, 
let, let me say that, in a broader context, my thoughts are not Don's thoughts. And I, the question I actually get more often is, are you calculating my BMI? <laughs> and, and no, I have no idea how to calculate some, I no idea how to estimate somebody's BMI. So, so I'm not Don, I don't have any special set against vegans, but they say a character is a third someone you know, a third yourself, and a third your makeup. So some of, some of Don is a friend I go jogging with, and a few other people like him. Some of Don is myself, especially the drinking. And, and some of Don I, I make up. And the million that I made up it was just a logical flow of, um, of, of the sort of trouble he might have got himself into without, you know, without picking that up. All right, thank you so much. <laughs>